Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to that place where our Savior Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. A reading from the book of Acts. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please now turn in your bulletin to Psalm 1, and let's recite the psalm in unison. Happy are those who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. They are like trees planted by the streams of water, bearing fruit in the due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is due. A reading from the first letter of John. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The word of the Lord.
Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus prayed, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept the word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Over the past decade, I, along with a team of others, have led the Church Development Institute in the Diocese of Georgia. Some of you may have heard of that as CDI, and y'all had a team that was attending it. When COVID hit last year, we had completed two of the four weekends of the cycle in the largest class ever. Clearly, it was a disappointment to have to stop an even greater disappointment that we haven't been able to get back to it yet. In previous years, we would finish the fourth weekend of that cycle with a graduation ceremony for those people that had completed their two years. And it would end with the Eucharist and with the bishop coming in to give us a homily. Well, in the last year that we did this, in 2019, we knew that the bishop wasn't going to be able to be with us. So the trainers decided to do this a little bit different. Instead of the trainers leading the university, we invited all the graduates, graduates to, to lead the service, to design it and lead the service. And this went really well. It was heartfelt. It was uh, special. It was done in the chapel at uh, Honey Creek. And you could feel the relationship that they had built with each other over two years. We had people that had met others from all over the diocese and had become close friends as they shared themselves and they shared their successes and failures with the, the projects that they did. They got to know each other really well. The homilist at the service pointed out that they had chosen a team not really knowing what to expect in CDI, and I understand that. But he said what was special for them was two things. The first was the relationships that they gathered from all over the diocese and being able to see and experience how all of the churches did things a little bit different than what we had so much in common. And the second thing that was special was that they came to the realization that all the churches have changed over time and are continuing to change 
and that change is really one of the few constants in the world. My dad used to tell me, and I'm sure all of you have heard this, that the only things in life that are certain are death and taxes. I, I could say, Dad, now there's another one, and it's called change. Um, and, and whether you try to change or fight the change, it doesn't really matter, because when change happens around you, you inevitably will change, whether you know it or not. It doesn't stop people from resisting change. You see, change is difficult for us as individuals, as human beings, or as a church, or as a denomination, or even as a religion. As a church, we try to keep things the same, and inevitably, we are often disappointed in that. Now, before you think I'm advocating changing everything, I'm not. Uh, let me put my comments in the context. We're all different, right? We all grew up in different families. We're not all from Albany. We didn't all grow up here. We're different ages, so we have experienced life for different periods of time in different places, under different circumstances, with different parents. And so when we look at the world, we see the world through a different set of lenses, and we each see something a little bit different. And what we experience are the changes in the world, and we've experienced those changes differently. differently. But let's put that in the context of Christianity. And, and in that context, we look at it slightly different. This past week, Christians celebrated Ascension Day. How many of you have celebrated Ascension Day? Very good. Uh, it's one of those holidays. It's a special feast in the, in, the, in the life of the church. Yet it always occurs during the middle of the week because it's 40 days after Easter. And so it's never on a Sunday. So rarely do we have a church service in a church where we celebrate it. But Ascension marked a significant change in the life of Christianity. As I think about other major events in the liturgical year, we have things like the incarnation, the birth of Jesus, the death of Christ on the cross, the resurrection, ascension, obviously I just mentioned, and Pentecost, the day that the Holy Spirit descended among the disciples. These are historical events. They haven't changed since they occurred. And we celebrate most of them each year. Not all of them, but most of them. And those things have become constants in the lives of Christians. Yet at the time that they occurred, they represented monumental changes in everybody's lives and in the life, particularly, of Christianity. The traditions that we celebrate around these events are different in different parts of the world, from denomination to denomination, and from generation to generation. But the events themselves have not changed since the beginning. And there are other changes within our church. You know, things like changing from the 1928 prayer book to the 1979 prayer book. I could look around the room and see that there's some people that are saying, what was the 28 prayer book? Because they don't know any other prayer book except the one that we've got now. But that was a big deal at the time. Yet we still celebrate Holy Week, Easter, Ascension, Pentecost, just as our forefathers did, going back some 2,000 years. So there are some constants, but there are also changes that are going around those constants. Said differently, we still bring people to know and love Christ, but we're doing it in different ways than they did 2,000 years ago. We're using different traditions, different language, different music, different liturgies, all of those things surrounding are different. How we go about doing those things have changed because the world has changed around us. How we do these things at St. Paul's is different from other Episcopal churches. We don't all do, this, do it the same way from church to church. We don't do it the same way that Anglicans do it in England or Australia or Kenya or Singapore. And I think God is well pleased with this because God made all of us different from the beginning and expects us to be different. 
When your new rector arrives, you can expect more changes. Because that rector will probably do things different than the way I do it, and I do it different than the people that have come before me. Your ministries will probably change to some degree. You'll still celebrate the same feasts. Those don't go away. Those are constants. And you, you'll still do many of the same ministries, although you may find new and different ways to do them. If nothing else, I think we need to acknowledge that Jesus came into the world and changed it in a radical way. He preached a different gospel. That was real change at the time. It changed the, the world as, as people knew it, and it continues to change it even today. But you have to admit, there are a lot of differences in the little things, like the words that we use in our liturgy. We tend to think of the role of women in the church as a huge change. Yet I can imagine Jesus saying to himself, well, they finally got something right. Jesus came into the world to change the world as humans knew it. So in this sense, change is something that was created by God. If we follow this logic, it seems to me that God would want us to engage change and be willing to change in order to fulfill the commandments. God also gave us a gift of choice. He gave us the ability to think and to use this ability to make informed decisions. We can choose to have a relationship with God or not. We can choose to have a relationship with our neighbors or not. We can choose to bring the gospel of Jesus to those that don't have a relationship with God or not. These are choices that each of us can make. Just as the apostles chose to carry the gospel to the world, but they said yes. If you think we've experienced change, think of what the apostles experienced. Here was God incarnate walking among them, although I'm not sure all of them recognized him as God incarnate at the time. Uh, but they did recognize him as a friend, a teacher, someone special, someone that they loved, and that he loved them back. They saw their friend and teacher arrested and nailed to a cross. At the same time, they feared for their own lives because of their association with him. But then three days later, Jesus was back, once again teaching and instructing them on what he expected of them. Jesus told them to go into the world, to all corners of the earth, and carry the teaching of God, the God of love, to everyone. Leave everything you own and love behind and go into the world. And folks, that's real change, something that only a few people really experience today. Then Jesus was gone. And they witnessed this on the day of ascension, when Jesus ascended into heaven with an instruction to stay together, to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus knew that his apostles and disciples were mere humans, the same as us. And he knew that, that change was difficult for mere humans. And that he was asking them not only to accept change, but to go forward and actually be agents of change. Change that was not going to be popular. They could have said no, but they didn't. They said yes. In today's Gospel from John, we hear Jesus praying for the disciples. In choosing to follow Christ, we have committed ourselves to become disciples in the world, just as they were disciples. So when Jesus is praying to God for his disciples, he's praying for us, for you and me, just as he was praying for them then. Jesus goes on to pray. He says to God, as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Jesus asks God to be with and protect his disciples from the evil one. Jesus knew, just as we know now, that God's message to love one another is not easy. 
It's going to be difficult for many people, particularly those that seek power, those that value wealth and self above all else. So Jesus asked God to be with those who believe in his name and carry the gospel to the entire world. And from that time in history to today, the disciples have continued to change the world. They've continued to bring the gospel to those who don't believe, to give them hope and access to eternal life, and in doing so, changing lives forever. And that's what we're called to do as disciples, as modern day disciples. Jesus' prayer to God is for God to be with us and protect us, to give us the words to go out into the world and change lives. You notice Jesus didn't ask to keep the world the same, but to be change agents, to go forth into the world and change lives. Mother Teresa is reputed to have said, not all of us will do great things for God, but each of us can do small things with great love. God has chosen us. God has blessed us. God has taught us. God fills us with the Holy Spirit and sends us out into the world so that all the world will know that God is love. In his holy name, amen. Especially Theitis. 
Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for Mary, Pat, Lauren, Carmela, Madge, Ann, Carol, Jack, Sylvia, David, Kay, Jane, Bud, Jim, Mary, Andrew, Joel, and John. Pray, praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, you have made us one with your saints in heaven and on earth. Grant that in our earthly pilgrimage, we may always be supported by this fellowship of love and prayer, and know ourselves to be surrounded by their witness to your power and mercy. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom all our intercession, intercessions are acceptable through the Spirit, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good to see everyone this morning. It's a beautiful day outside, and I hope we get to see some of it when the service is over. Uh, today, we're going to have acolyte training immediately following this service. So when the service is over, um, take about five minutes, take a little break. Uh, acolyte, you can get unvested if you like, and uh, we'll meet in the back of the church. And parents, if you'd like to come along, we'd love to have you sit in with us um, so that you'll see what your your children are going to be doing as acolytes. And if there are any adults that would like to be acolytes, we'd love to have you participate in, uh, in, participate in the training. The second item for today is uh, how we're going to worship in, uh, on Sundays. And we've gotten new guidelines, as I mentioned last week, from the bishop. Immediately after issuing those, uh, we saw that the CDC issued some new guidelines that basically said you don't need to wear masks if you're fully vaccinated. That's fine, but they didn't really address churches where we're going to have people who are vaccinated and those who are not, particularly the younger generation. Um, they didn't talk about singing without a mask. We can sing with a mask. But they didn't talk about singing without a mask. And so the, the bishop has said, let's be cautious about removing masks. Let's uh, respect everybody else uh, that's here and uh, continue to wear the mask, whether you're vaccinated or not, just to protect everybody else that's here. And I think that's a good 
stance to take at this time. We're all hopeful that we'll get to the point where we can take our masks off totally, but we're not quite there yet, but we're making progress. Um, the two big changes uh, for next week, I'm say there's three, really. Uh, you'll notice when you came in today, uh, the ushers were not asking you where you were gonna sit, so we're not required to do contact tracing anymore. Um, so that's a big change for the ushers who have done a fantastic job over the, the last year keeping track of where everybody sat in the event that we had to do some contact tracing. The second thing is that we are gonna sing and we're gonna start that next Sunday. We will sing with masks, but everything that we used to sing at the 1030 service, we will be singing again starting next Sunday. So please come out and uh, bring your voices with you and let's all join in together. The third thing is that um, we've uh, decided as a diocese to, to, uh, to make communion in both kinds available. Not, not every church is gonna do that uh, because some of the churches are not as far along as we are at this point. I was on a call with five other dioceses earlier this week and I'll say that where we are today is we're ahead of most of all the other dioceses. Some of them are just now going back to, uh, to outdoor service. Uh, whereas some are thinking about doing communion of both kinds, but they aren't ready to, to do that yet. Um, in order to be respectful of uh, people's concerns for safety, but also for tradition, um, and to include everybody, we're gonna offer communion in two ways. One will be uh, to drink from the common cup, and we'll do that again starting next week. But we'll also make available individual cups for those of you that do not want to partake of the, uh, the common cup. To participate in, in drink from the common cup, we're gonna ask on our honor system that you have had both of your vac vaccinations and that you're they're fully effective um, in order to, to take from the common cup. If you've had the vaccinations and you still don't want the common cup, we've got the individual cups available. And for everyone that has not been vaccinated, we're gonna ask that you uh, take communion from the small individual cups. We'll explain all of this again next week and uh, we'll learn as we go on how we do this and um, I'm going to say that this is not a forever commitment that we're going to offer the little cups, but I think we need to try it uh, for five or six months and see how it works and maybe make some adjustments along the way. In CDI, we call this do, reflect, do. You do something, reflect on it. You need to change it, you change it. Um, but we think right now that offers the best of both worlds. And it respects tradition, it also respects everybody's concern about safety, and it's inclusive, it's something for everybody. So you can expect to see that next, next Sunday. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and sacrifice to God.
give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we now to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true past Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever see this end to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory.
Give you your hearts and minds.